Good evening. We begin tonight with breaking news. While President Trump and his Treasury Secretary refused to hand over the president's tax records to House Democrats, the New York Times has obtained a decade's worth of his tax information, and their findings are eye-popping, stunning. There's a lot of different adjectives you could use. We'll talk to one of the reporters coming up. All of this coming as the stiff arming from the White House hit a new level. Today, blocking former White House counsel Don McGahn from turning over documents to the House Judiciary Committee. That comes, of course, a day after Attorney General William Barr refused to meet a deadline to hand over the full unredacted Mueller report to Congress. The same day that, as we mentioned, the Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin said no to turning over the president's taxes. And in at least that incident, tonight we're getting the clearest picture yet of why the president might not want that information out. It doesn't look good for him in that information. Joining me is uh, Suzanne Craig of the New York Times. She shares the byline of this breaking story. Decade in the red, Trump tax figures show over $1 billion in business losses. Uh, this is incredible in its scope and detail. Uh, can you just lay out in your reporting, and again, it, it's on the New York Times, so <laughs> people should go and read yeah. the full thing. But we're talking over a billion dollars over a decade. That's just for his core businesses. Every year that we looked at, he lost money, and the losses grew as he went further into the casinos and the losses that, that happened there. But it's unbelievable. We would have thought at least in one of the years that we saw, maybe the year he wrote Art of the Deal, he would have made money. He didn't. He was just bleeding money every year that we looked at on his businesses. In certain years, uh, Donald Trump, uh, according to your reporting, lost more than nearly any other individual taxpayer in the United States. Is that right? Yeah, it's in incredible because we, we had both his tax information and then we were able to compare it to a database of people who make a fair bit of money, and that was a one-third sampling, but even within that, he was, often years, was the largest number for losses in America. He lost. So, I mean, uh, it's, the it's irony is stunning. he was actually the biggest loser, to use a term he would use if this was, if he was labeling somebody If up. he was writing the headline at the New York Times, that would be it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um, he, but, I mean, he lost so much money, he was, did he pay income tax? He paid income tax in two of the 10 years, and one of them was- oh, a, In only two of in 10 two years? In two of 10 years, and it was the alternate minimum tax in one of the years, for example, just why. One of them was he had a big salary number one year because of a deal he did with Merv Griffin, and so he paid the AMT. It wasn't a lot, but only two of the 10 years. So he, he, he so only paid a small amount those Very two years. small amount. He hit the AMT two years. So why was he losing so much money? because his businesses just weren't doing well. They actually were doing horribly year in and year out. And he had some decent investments. You know, we saw them here and there, but, you know, always they were just, you know, the losses just flooded them. Like he, he would make money here, but then he would just lose money. He had a foray into stock trading, for example, and he was, there was years where he would make money and then he just lost it all in the next year. It's incredible that banks were loaning him I mean, it was banks that were, I, I guess, that were keeping yep. him afloat. Deutsche Bank, we know, you know, he, he would uh, default on loans to one part of Deutsche Bank, and those bankers would say, okay, we're not going to have anything more to do with him, and he would just go to another department yeah, in la Deutsche later, Bank. Yeah, later in his career he did, and he right. ended up dealing with the private wealth group, but the banks took a bath on him. And, and for, for the banks, when you look back at that period, a lot of them still remember just how bad it was and some of them still will not do business with him because of what happened you know it all it all kind of came to a head in 1990 when his casino started to go bankrupt but for years we have thought that that was sort of where it started but now we know he just never made money in those years and it was just so he, it was shocking was, for us to see and we led with it that the year he wrote art of the deal this master of the universe which by the way memoir written son by you know, by somebody Tony else, but yeah. But he, that year, he lost tens of millions of dollars. It's incredible. The, has there, is there any response from the president on this reporting? They have, we, the, the information that we have is from an IRS transcript, and mm. they're simply saying that, the, that the, the numbers in it, they're saying that they're wrong, but they have not provided us with any information about what is wrong. They've just said that the transcript is questionable. So, so explain that, because you do not have a copy of his tax returns, which, which is obviously what the fight now uh, is with the Treasury Department. You have printouts from an official IRS tax transcript. What is that? It's something within the IRS that they use when they want to collect, you know, year after year of information on a taxpayer. IRS employees use it when they're doing, when they're dealing with things like audit. 
audits. And in fact, we, you know, we looked at it, we not only had it, we verified it. And the individual who gave it to us also gave us 10 years of his father's tax returns, which we happen to have because of prior reporting that we have mm. done, matched it matched it number for number. It was unbelievable. So we didn't find any inaccuracies in it. We also did other things to verify it. But if we, we just couldn't, we couldn't see that there w was any inaccuracies. And we went to great lengths to verify it, including getting Fred Trump's tax returns. So what is this, uh, uh, for the battle over tax returns, is there more in the actual tax returns that you would like to see? Yeah, I mean, this was, it was, it, it's incredible what we were able to see just with the information that we were provided, but we don't have the schedules. And one of the frustrating things that we saw was, for example, in one of the years, he had more than $50 million in what's known as interest income. And this is income you're going to get if you have mortgages or if you have bonds coming in, you will be getting interest from those. And every year he had 10 or 13 or less million dollars. And then this one year he had 50 some million dollars. We couldn't explain it. We, and we had actually in that year access to a lot of you know, his holdings to see what might be generating that sort of interest income. Mm. And if we had his schedules, we would know what the sources of that income were. And to me, you know, when I think about the modern day tax returns and why they are so important, it's because we need to see his sources of income. We need to know who's paying him and where that money is coming from. And right now we just, don't know, you know, where that hidden hand is because we don't have his tax returns or the schedules that go mm. with them. Uh, it's just incredible reporting. Suzanne Craig, appreciate it. It's on the New York Times website. Obviously, people should Thanks check it out. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to get reaction now from Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal, a member of the Judiciary Committee. Senator Blumenthal, uh, I assume you've, you've seen the report. These, uh, it, it certainly paints a picture of President Trump that is much different than certainly the, the picture that he has painted of, of his business acumen. The biggest loser is certainly a contrast to his boasts about his business acumen. But very significantly, this report raises many more significant questions than this wonderful reporting was able to answer. And it sheds light on why President Trump may be the first president in decades to refuse to disclose his tax returns. It also demonstrates irrefutably why the Congress is well justified in seeking those tax returns, as has been done now by subpoena. And the American people should be asking, what's in those six years of current tax returns that Donald Trump wants to conceal? I mean, a decade in the red with $1 billion in, uh, in losses is, is extraordinary. And this time period examined in the reporting, it's not at the center of the battle between the Trump administration and Congress, but certainly all of this underscores the fact there's so much that just isn't known still about the president's finances. There is so much that is unknown here, and it underscores the importance of the lawsuit that I have brought along with almost 200 of my colleagues, Blumenthal versus Trump, that seeks the story and evidence of his payments and benefits from foreign governments to him, which he continues to refuse to disclose to the American people or to Congress as is required by the Emoluments Clause, the chief anti-corruption provision in the United States Constitution. Donald Trump is defying the Constitution, breaking the law by failing to disclose those details of his ongoing dealings with foreign governments. And so it is a stunning picture of spectacular collapse during those years, which is the term the report uses. But it also indicates very clearly why the American people deserve more truth from the White House, from this president about his business dealings. I want to ask you about the White House clearly continuing to stonewall uh, the latest example instructing uh, Don McGahn to defy the subpoena for documents. So, I mean, what are the Democrats' options at this point, other than House Judiciary Chairman Nadler tonight saying they could move to hold McGahn in contempt? Holding Don McGahn in contempt means holding the president accountable, along with others who may have participated in obstruction of justice. And that accountability means airing the truth. Right now, the American people have many of the president's alkalites and sycophants saying no collusion, no obstruction, and case closed. But holding Don McGahn in contempt of court and enforcing that contempt through the courts is the prime avenue we have for telling the American people the truth about what happened, letting them hear and see from McGahn and from Mueller 
and from the unredacted report, which we are also seeking, so they can make a judgment about what the proper remedy is, and we can present that case.